Greetings, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I'm going to read some of David Jeremiah's book, Super Clear Voice. I love this guy. He's published like 280 books. He studies prophecy, Turning Point Ministries. Highly recommend his books. His books are better than mine. He's amazing. I love Revelation and Genesis because I don't think Satan wants us to know about his original trick in the Garden of Eden because he wants us to act like we're our own gods. So he tempts us into living as if we are our own gods. The word says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Well, he doesn't want you to believe in your heart. He wants you to believe in yourself. Continue to do drugs, continue to drink, continue to be promiscuous, continue to serve him even if you're in church. So he doesn't want you to know Genesis and he definitely doesn't want you to know Revelation because in Revelation, it shows that he is in hell. He loses. We stand in victory. And so I love both of those. And I love how everything in between that is prophecy that fills out. And so you've had to put up with my sermons. Well, now you're going to hear somebody who's even smarter who, who I'm going to read from. So God, Satan rebelled against God and corrupted his perfect creation. The end times role of this diabolical agent of the apocalypse is detailed in just one place in the Bible, the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. This chapter presents significant truths about Satan's nemesis, his name, his vendetta, and his end. Each of these is introduced by the word great, a great sign, a woman, Revelation 12, a great fiery dragon, verse 3, a great wrath, verse 12, two wings of a great eagle. As we explore these truths, we will discover the foundation that support our dramatization about this creature who is the source of evil, all evil. The great sign of a woman. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon unto her, under her feet, and up her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. The pleasure of this woman is startling. She is clothed with the sun, standing on the moon and wearing a crown of 12 stars. Perhaps most significantly, she is in the throes of childbirth. Then are numerous ideas about the meaning of this woman, but only one is consistent with the teaching of the entire word of God. This represents the nation of Israel, and she makes her entrance into the drama as the targeted victim of Satan's malevolence. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel is often portrayed as a... Do you remember how I said Satan is waiting to devour Jesus? He gets to that. For example, the prophet Isaiah writes, As a woman with a child is in pain and cries out, in her pangs, when she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind, and we have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth. That's Isaiah 20 and Micah 4. Isaiah's image of a woman in labor, failing, or give birth up to a child describes the failure of the Jewish people to bring about hope and salvation for humanity. And yet after hundreds of years of disappointment, hopes, the Jewish people had the privilege of bringing the deliverer into the world. She bore a child who will rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and his throne, Revelations 12:5. This remarkable statement captures three of the most significant events in Christ's life. One, his incarnation, she bore a male child. His ascension, her child was caught up to God and his throne. And third, he's, his second coming, he is going to rule all nations with iron. Now you remember in Revelation when John, the disciple that Jesus loves, sees Jesus. It's not the same Jesus. I keep telling you guys that. White hair, eyes of fire, sword in the mouth. He's coming back to rule in judgment. The final fulfillment of Revelations 12.5 is recorded for us near the end of the book of Revelation. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it should strike the nations and he himself 
will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's Revelations 19. So the first great sign in Revelation 12 is a woman, Israel. Her child is Satan's ultimate nemesis, Christ himself, the grand hero of the end times drama, the great dragon. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Okay, he gets way deeper than I do. That's why I'm reading it to you guys. So the, there's Satan trying to devour our baby, our baby Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer. So that's what's happening there. Satan's path is ever downward, from heaven to earth, from earth to the bottomless pit, from the bottomless pit to the lake of fire. Here in Revelation 12, pulls the curtain aside and lets us view Satan's expulsion from heaven. Verse 9 gives us perhaps a more complete description of Satan than any other passage in the Bible. He is called the great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, Satan, and the deceiver of the whole world. Not a very pretty picture. It is important to recognize that these descriptions are not about his physical appearance. They show what his nature is like. It is not correct to assume that Satan is ugly, like a dragon. Actually, he is bright like the sun and glorious in appearance. Paul says that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light in 2 Corinthians. In fact, his original name, Lucifer, means star of the morning. Satan's activity mimics his name. He deceives by hiding the hideous nature of his sin under a facade of attractiveness. He is vicious, vile, and ferocious. His color is red for the path, for his path has always been stained with blood and death. And calling Satan a serpent, this passage reminds us of his cunning and deception in the Garden of Eden. From the very beginning, Satan has opposed God and plotted the death of humanity. Our Lord said he was a murderer from the beginning in John. It is generally understood that Satan in the Old Testament, named for this evil being, and the devil in the New Testament name, the name Satan means adversary. Satan is the adversary of God and of every one of God's children. And he is a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy every covenant. He wants to destroy every marriage. We're going to read that he's trying to destroy Israel. And let me keep going. I can't see. Lastly, the devil is described as the one who deceives the whole world. The devil's purpose is, in the past, was to keep Christ away from the world. Having failed that goal, the only option left to him is to keep the world away from Christ. He does so by sprinkling lies with truths and half-truths to create doubts in our minds about the faithfulness and glory of God. That's why we're praying for the persecuted church. They go to the right underneath the throne. There's different levels of heaven. There's different levels of hell, it looks like. Paul exposed this strategy in his letter to the Corinthians, saying that Satan has blinded people's minds. Let the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. After describing Satan's nature in Revelation 12, goes on to describe his power, his, per his partners, and his purpose. Satan's power, the fiery red dragon of Revelation 12.3, has seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Biblically speaking, the number seven usually symbolizes totality or completion, and the head cut conveys the idea of intelligence. The horns are a symbol of strength. So for the dragon to have seven heads and ten horns speaks of Satan's distinct intelligence and cunning. Satan's counterfeit strategy. So basically, Satan is like a step behind. It says that the angels in Peter are looking in to see what's going to happen. There is a war going on in heaven and a war going on down here. And it's awesome. I love to be a part of it. And it's truth. You just use God's word. Jesus Christ is the light of the world in John. Satan transforms himself into an angel of light in 2 Corinthians. He's the king of kings in 1 Timothy, our Jesus is. And Satan is the king of the children of of pride in Job. Our Christ is the Prince of Peace in Isaiah, and Satan is 
the prince of the power of the air. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, I always mention that. Our, our Christ is Lord, my God, and Zechariah, and Satan is God of this age. So he is God of this world for right now. It's his. Okay, Jesus, lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation, and Satan, roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. The crowns or diadems on his head are in keeping with the portrait of Satan throughout the Bible. He is crown, he's a crowned monarch. In Matthew 12, Jesus refers to Satan as, as a king with a kingdom. See, I told you. Elsewhere, he is described as the ruler of this age, Ephesians 6.12. Three times in the book of John, Satan is referred to as the prince of this world. I told you. In 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to Satan, the god of this age. And in Ephesians 2.2, he's the prince of the power of the air. As the prince of this world, Satan has subjects, evil men and women. And as the prince of the power of the air, he, he has subjects, evil spirits. He is the ruling spirit over those bent on disobedience and the architect of the evil of the world. So think politics, think all the stuff that we see, even the churches that are blaspheming the name of God. He's infiltrated them. We are told that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. In last days, this great falling away, people want so much influence. They want to be on TV. They're willing to sell out to be on TV. And I can understand why they would think, oh, well, my, my anointing's so good. I got to get it on TV. For gosh sakes, it's got to reach more people. So I'll go ahead and link arms with this guy who speaks blasphemy. God did not give Satan the world to rule. Satan wrested it from the hands of Adam and Eve. God had charged them to fill the earth and subdue it and to have dominion over it. Every living thing on the earth. When the promised, when the, when the primeval couple fell from the God-given throne, Satan filled it himself. So we see some bad doctrine with these prosperity guys. I'm not going to name names because I can't even remember them. But one guy, I, I, I studied his doctrine and he, $100 million, jet worth 100 whatever, just way horrible, looks evil to me. And he basically says that, well, we are gods because he's acting like we are gods. That's what Satan tempted Adam and Eve with. Be your own gods. Eat of the fruit. He doesn't want you to be as smart as him. It's like saying, hey, live by the dictates of your heart. If you're homosexual, it's okay. You won't die. Surely you won't go to hell. Jesus didn't really mean it's a narrow path to, to heaven. He didn't really mean that. So Revelation 12, 4 says, Lucifer's tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Here, the stars represent angels, just as they are called when they sing together at the creation of the world in Job. When Lucifer fell in pride and arrogance against God, he took a third of the angels with him. Some people struggle with the idea of Satan having angels based on their presumption. All angels are good. Yet later in the 12th chapter of Revelation, we are told that Michael had a host of angels against the dragon and his angels. In Jesus' address on the Mount of Olives, he affirmed that Satan has angels. God will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you, you cursed in everlasting fire pre prepared for the devil and his angels. So that's Jesus mentioning hell, everlasting fire that's prepared. So there is a hell. In 2 Peter 2.4 and Jude 1.6, we read that some of the fallen angels are imprisoned and that those who are not work for Satan as accomplices. These fallen angels have lost all semblance of what was once good in them. They have been organized by, by their matter Master, master of Satan, to influence humans actively and world events behind the scenes for evil. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, Paul writes, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of this dark, the darkness of this age and the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 6.12. Clearly, these evil angels, like their master, those also have been given freedom in the universe. Lucifer was allowed to creep into the Garden of Eden, and he's has been restricted access to the presence of God, where he accuses the brethren constantly. And we see that in Job and Revelation. Satan's servants are likewise at work in the world, executing his diabolical strategy. And as times get closer to the end, it says that the Holy Spirit is barely restraining for people like me to speak truth uniquely in a different way and for you guys to be brought to repentance. And, and then eventually all the demons are let out and the rest of Revelation starts happening. Satan's purpose from the very beginnings, 
has been to destroy the child of the woman, like I've been telling you guys. The, ch the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour the child as soon as it was born, Revelation 12, 4. When God told Satan in the Garden of Eden that the, that the second seed of the woman shall bruise your head, that's Genesis 3.15 I always refer to when I try to explain the spiritual war. Satan began his campaign to eradicate that promised seed, knowing from prophecy that the promised one would spring from Israel. The adversary did everything he could to keep that nation from being formed. He incited Esau to attempt to kill his brother Jacob, who would father the 12 tribes of Israel. So you have Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so that lineage. When you have Ishmael, it goes the other way. That was the one that was um, the bond servant, Hagar. And so they didn't live by the promise. They didn't wait on God's promise. And then that is the Arab nations. I believe that's what Islam came from. So when that failed, he incited Pharaoh to murder all the Jewish baby boys in Egypt. Had either Jacob or Moses not survived, the nation of Israel would not have existed. So we see God's hand. You know, he gets his things done no matter what Satan does. At one point in Israel's history, Satan almost succeeded. The promised redeemer was to come through the royal line of David. I say that the Davidic line, and when I, when I say the branch was cut down and a new shoot was grown out of it, out of the tribe of Judah, he's going to go way deeper into that. After David's descendant, King Jehoshaphat, died, a series of intrigues and murders eliminated the entire Davidic lineage except for King Abaziah and his family, Ahaz Ahaziah, was also murdered, and the queen mother usurped the crown and killed all of his children, finally ending the royal line, or so she thought. But the high priest's wife managed to hide Azahiah's youngest son, jo Joash, until he, could, until he could be crowned. And that little boy, that lone male survivor of Israel's royalty, resided the promised seed and the ultimate purpose of God. That's 2 Chronicles 22. Thwarted but undaunted, Satan incited the wicked Haman to plot the extermination of all the Jews. And then God raised up Esther. That's why you women out there, you guys are soldiers. Mary Magdalene, Esther, a bunch of other ones. For such a time as this, to expose Haman's scheme and the promised seed was spared. That's in Esther. When the prophesied child was finally born, Satan instilled fear and hatred in King Herod, who had all the babies in Bethlehem murdered. He thought that surely the promised seed would be slain in this insidious act of infanticide. infanticide. But the sovereign hand of God intervened and discredited Joseph and, and, and basically came in a dream, I think, intervened to Joseph to take his family to Egypt, thus sparing Jesus' life. Immediately after Jesus' baptism, Satan confronted him in the wilderness with the three Famous temptations portrayed in our dramatization. But Jesus rendered his adversary powerless with the word of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. So the word of God does the work. It bends people. It changes people. It rearranges people. Your interpretation of it, sometimes it's okay if you're as good as this guy or if you can relate with the people. But please do not get off the subject of spiritual war, repentance, turning from dark to, not, dark to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, testifying about it. That's how chains are broken, not by just intellectualizing and telling us for 10 to 15 minutes exactly what it was like in that area and we're freaking asleep. By the time you even get to any spiritual war, if you ever do, I'm going to do a, a sermon on preacher man. Preacher man supposed to be praying way more than, than he is for his congregation. He's not supposed to be like this, judging his congregation. He's supposed to be praying for him. I'm going to bring up E.M. Bounds, a prayer warrior. After the failure, the devil made two attempts to murder Jesus by proxy. He tried to coerce the people of Nazareth to throw Jesus off the top of a hill in Luke 4. And then he fanned the hatred of the scribes and Pharisees until they tried to stone him to death in John. But each time, Jesus miraculously escaped unharmed. Finally, on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, Satan saw the fruition of a centuries-long campaign when the Son of God, the promised seed, succumbed to the bloody death on a cross. When Christ's mangled body was wrapped in linen, embalmed in spices, and sealed in a sepulchre, Satan thought he had won, but God had purposed for this promised child to rescue and rule the nations. And God never changes his purposes. On the third day, he raised Jesus from the dead, thwarting Satan's purpose. 
the great war. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. Boom. So Satan's kicked out. He is restrained. It's like taking somebody's candy away, taking their drugs away. It's like taking every bit of freedom they had away, and they're just angry and hateful, and they're try and it, trying to separate you from the truth, which is Christ Jesus rose from the dead. Power in the name of Jesus. It's over. Every mindset that's of the devil is broken. You stand in victory of it. And you speak it boldly. And the more you speak it boldly and what God's done in your life, the more power you have because he's giving you that power by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you speak his word forth, the Holy Spirit and the angels rejoice and they push you forward. And then it goes out and it, it pulls the chains off of other people. That's why I get frustrated with churches that are like scared of dudes that were ex-gangsters like me that have published all these books should have me preaching like all over the place. Other people, same thing. People that were in ISIS, same thing. People that were LGBTQ that gave up their rights, same thing. Like, what are you afraid of? You guys aren't really affecting much change. You're just out there, like, keeping them drunk, keeping them high on drugs. Are you guys on drugs? Most of you guys aren't. These verses refer not just to the single battle, but to the war with many battles on many fronts. These include the battle between Michael and Satan, the battle between Satan-led angels and God-led angels, and the battle between Satan-led people and God-led people. The book of Revelation tells us that the final battle between this, these fierce enemies is to occur eventually. It is important to remember that there is no such thing as abstract evil. Evil pays Evil always originates in an intelligent, self-aware personality, either that or Satan himself or one or more of the other angelic creatures delegated to perform his will. The passage in the Bible that most clearly demonstrates this truth and angelic conflict that results is Daniel chapter 10. Daniel had been in prayer for 21 days when an angel, probably Gabriel, visited him in a vision. The angel opened that Daniel's prayer. And so basically, Daniel picks up Jeremiah's prophecy, talking about the 70-year captivity. He realizes the 70 years is almost up, and then he starts getting involved in it. And then Daniel, he basically says Jesus is going to come in 483 years. He does this crazy timeline. That's how we know, that's how we can deduce that there's a tribulation of seven years because of the way he does everything. Daniel was an amazing prayer warrior. And so his prayers were inter intercepted. And, and I can't see this that clearly, but that, that's what I'm going to try to get to. It is evident the prince of Persia was a fallen angel under Satan's control. This passage isn't referring to an earthly prince because no human could successfully resist an angelic message of God. So this angel above was trying to get to Daniel. Daniel has the most rad repentance moment for his nation, for his people. He was literally so repentant that he was like not sure that he was okay with God. That's why repentance is so awesome because we're always trying to find out, God, what am I not seeing clearly enough? search my heart out. You hear David say that. You hear Jeremiah say that. Search my heart out, Lord. Is there anything I could see more clearly and be more useful to you and understand how the enemy could still be trying to hold me back? Like I could have got, I almost sold a TV show to Oprah's own network through Gabriella Bernstein. And at the time I wanted it so bad because I was coming out of a divorce. I was a little bit depressed and I thought this is going to fix me. This will show her, you know what I mean? And I'm really kind of glad that I never, that it never happened because I probably would have had too much influence so God's timing is always best with everything. I see so many people falling away because they want influence. So here we go. Well, how much time am I on here? Okay, I'm going to be done soon. That the opponent is identified as the Prince of Persia shows how Satan has organized his angelic troops and has assigned a fallen angel to every country and province. This prince was responsible for Persia, which held the Jewish nation in captivity. Michael and Gabriel managed to destroy this evil angel's influence over the Persian area and establish their own influence on behalf of God's people. It was a complete harmony with the word of God to believe that the prince of Persia who oppressed Daniel was the devil's own angel. These scenes of angelic conflict in Revelation and Daniel show us that the war in heaven, the forces of evil and the forces of good rages throughout the invisible regions of heaven as well as here on earth. In Peter it says the angels are looking in to see what's going to happen. How awesome is that? Perhaps you are like waiting for you to step up a little bit further, to break that addiction, to speak into people, to speak life, to say, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm, I'm ready to march on for God. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be scared anymore. I'm not going to be scared of my past. 
I'm not going to be scared to step up and ask for a raise. Maybe that's what it is or something. Just step out more boldly. God, God loves bold Christians. Perhaps you were thinking, but he hasn't, but hasn't Satan already been judged? That is correct. He, he has been judged at the cross. When the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Because the ruler of this world is judged, Hebrews 2.14 echoes this idea, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, Christ himself likewise shared in the same, and through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that is, the devil. Since Satan has been judged by Christ's work at the cross, why then does the enemy seem to be winning? Well, let's, let's look at a drug addiction. A drug addict will literally tell me that they haven't used drugs when I can see they have, and I'll be like, just tell me the truth. I'm about to drug test you. We're going to see that you did it. I can tell. I used to know this biz. And, and they'll do it all the way there. And like, you have to find ways to coerce them to just finally admit it. They're going to try to find it all the way there. It's just how it is. Not to put down drug addicts, because God will break that for you, and you'll be a great testimony. But that's kind of a good analogy. The answer is that legally, Calvary was Satan's complete undoing. All the, his hopes disintegrated into ashes when the Lord Jesus died and rose again. Like any legal action, however, the decision must be enforced for our nation's courts, just like our convicted murders would sit on death row forever. The ultimate victory has been won, but it won't be totally implemented until some point in the future. In the meantime, it is heartening to know that Christ's victory over Satan can be enforced now by means of prayer. Daniel prayed for 21 days, and finally the angel of Satan was defeated. Earthly victories depend on heavenly victories, and vice versa. That's why I was saying, pastors, you should be praying. I should not be out praying you from the congregation. For your congregation, for the word to go forth, for it to do its work, for the hearts to be softened. I'll bring up Ian Bounds on one of these. We who battle evil on earth and fellow warriors with the angels who battle evil in the invisible realms and our prayers form a net network of power and communication that work in tandem on both fronts. This means the praying church actually wields a strong hand in determining the outcome of human events. As someone has said, it is not the mayors that make up the world, it's the prayers. Wow, I love that. Satan can still wreak havoc at our, as our dramatization shows, but he cannot win against Christians who claim the victory of Christ as his or her own. God's servants may encounter all kinds of persecution, even death, but their ultimate victory is guaranteed. This divine assurance gives us the courage to fight on, knowing we are pro protected from any weapon Satan can throw up on us, throw at us. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty by God, by pulling down strongholds, casting down every argument, casting down every vain pursuit, casting down every psychiatrist that wants you to smoke weed or cuss to alleviate stress. It's just like ridiculousness. It casts it down because Jesus Christ is the king. He is the healer, the redeemer, and the deliverer. And I made most of that up, and I'm going to go back to reading but I, I come from the Word of God with it. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The great wrath. Rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath because he knows his time is short. So as we get closer and closer and closer to the end, his time is short. That's why you're going to see evil speed up. You're going to see the name of the Lord blasphemed by the Pope. You're going to see a bunch of other people falling in line with that. You're going to be seeing them practically sell their soul to get on TV and, and try to peddle their influence and, and hang out with people that are saying homosexuality gets into the kingdom of heaven, saying, go ahead, smoke weed. Do whatever you want. Live by the dictates of your heart and you're right back to Genesis where God, where Satan came up and tempted them to be as smart as God. Surely you won't die. You can do it. Okay, that's about it for now. Okay, no, I'll do a little bit more. As the end of time when believers are, are arrive in heaven, they will have been made perfect in holiness and there will be nothing Satan can do to them. His role as accuser will be finished. His presence in heaven will be abruptly concluded as he is thrown one last time to the earth. But heaven's purification will mean the earth's pollution as Satan's fury explodes in an attempt to defy God and destroy his people. The book of Revelation describes the wrath that the earth will experience at the hands of Satan in the last days. An aggravated assault. Revelation 12, 12 gives us this warning. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down having great wrath. Because he knows his time is short. The word used for wrath here means strong passions and emotions. Donald Gray Barnhouse compares it to a caged animal. The animal that was dangerous enough when he roamed 
through the whole forest is now limited to a stockade where mad that the restrictions which he sees around him and raging because he feels the end is near he throws the insane strength of the death struggle into all his movements satan's assault against god's people will be marked by the desecration of the temple the installation of the image of the beast in the temple and the all-out persecution of the jewish people an anti-Semitic assault. The book of Revelation foretells the last wave of anti-Semitism. Now, by this point, you guys, the church is raptured. Most believe that God raptures the church. The Jews are, you know, really stubborn. But eventually, God does his work with them, too. And all his promises are yes and amen to them. You can just see how he's taking care of them. They came back as a nation in 1948, and that's just outrageous. When the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. Then he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. That's Revelation 12, 13. The devil hates Israel because from a biological perspective, Christ came from this nation. Satan wants to destroy Israel, denying its people a home. When the Messiah returns to earth and establishes his promised kingdom, the evil one is like a spiteful child who destroys a friend's toy. If he can't have it, he doesn't want anyone to have it. So as Revelation 12 tells it, Satan eats a flood, spews a flood of water out of his mouth to carry the woman Israel away. Some take this to mean that he will lose a literal flood that will sweep Israel down the Jordan Valley. Others see it as a symbolic, as symbolic of Satan's final effort to exterminate Israel. The nation, whatever the water like a flood may mean, it is certain that there will be an aggressive organized effort to attack and destroy the Jewish people. An angry assault. The last verse of Revelation 12 states that the dragon is enraged to the point of making war with those with the nation of Israel to keep the commandments who keep the commandments of God. So he's mad at people who do what God says. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So we're supposed to like try. This is a reference not to, Jews, not to Jews in general, but to Jewish believers. I agree with the many students of prophecy who identify this group as the 144,000 Jewish witnesses of Revelation 7. These sealed preachers certainly fulfill the description of obedience and the outward witness. Satan will be angry with these faithful followers for one reason. They have aligned themselves with, the great, with his greatest enemy, Jesus Christ, the great wing. So it keeps going. I'm almost done with that chapter. I'll hook you guys up with a little bit more. This guy's great. And... Basically, I'm on fire for the Lord. I love his word. I love to understand the spiritual war. I love, I already know the victory is all of ours. We just stand in it. That's why I do get frustrated with people um, preaching that it's okay to use drugs if it's medicated because that interrupts with your Holy Spirit voice. It keeps you in a bondage. It keeps you in a dependence. I get upset when I don't hear repentance and the wages of sin and the sanctification process and that we're called to be holy and purified and that of course we're never going to be perfect but we we start seeing more clearly and we can identify what's evil and we're standing more bold for his kingdom and we're fearless of man and we're just in fear of our god who created us that we don't want to disappoint him and it's a healthy fear and a healthy awe and reverence and life is much more freeing this way i go surf and play basketball do what i want i could still do whatever i want i just don't you know partake in fleshly desires i try not to cuss anymore you know i try not to you know do things that uh, would put an idol up in front of God. So we have power. The devil is already, his, his fate is sealed. We stand in the victory of it. It's exciting. Bless you. God bless you. Dear Lord, bless everybody hearing this. Let them be empowered by it. Let them seek this truth out for themselves. Let them hear your word. Let it go forth. Let it penetrate hearts, penetrate, reshape minds, get them uh, into the word, get them into worship music, get them identifying that life that they just don't want anymore, that they're just getting sick of it, that they see it's fruitless. They've chased everything and they're done chasing and they're like, hey, this is real. This dude was way over there and now he's just on fire. I, it's kind of attractive. And look what God's doing in his life. God bless you guys. Be encouraged, be empowered.